Hello and welcome into the Take 10 Podcast. This is Alex Root of Big Ten Network, and this episode's guests are Jenny Taft of Fox Sports and Harold Shelton, Big Ten Network's Manager of Research. Let's get into it. Take a look, listen, and enjoy. Look at here, look at here. With the catch, the finish! Oh, my goodness! What a catch! Oh, Energy. my goodness. Enthusiasm! All right, we'll get to our interview with Jenny Taft of Fox Sports in just a moment, but real quick, a word from our sponsor, Northwestern University's School of Professional Studies. You can build a solid foundation in the strategic, creative, and analytic skills that are essential for success in the business of sports in the master's program in sports administration at Northwestern University. Find out more at sps.northwestern.edu slash sports. Great opportunity there for anyone looking to get in the sports industry, get your foot in the door in the field, maybe work at a place like Big Ten Network. Check it out from our friends at Northwestern SPS. All right, getting into our interview with Jenny Taft now. Um, You'll hear about it in the upcoming discussion, but she's a recurring guest now on the show. We talked first uh, almost four years ago, and she is uh, the nicest person of all time. Always a pleasure to talk to um, and has great stories about her time, not only on the lead college football crew with Gus Johnson and Joel Klatt, but now for the last few years as the host of Undisputed with uh, Skip Bayless and Shannon Sharp on Fox, so or on FS1. So a lot of stuff to talk about with Jenny, a uh, really interesting conversation, and we'll get right to it. It is Take 10 Podcast Discussion with Jenny Taft. All right, I'm very pleased to be joined by the host of Skip and Shannon, Undisputed, and the lead college football reporter for Fox Sports. Very uh, excited to welcome back Jenny Taft to the show. Jenny, how are you? Hi, great to chat. I uh, I can't believe it's been so long since I joined you last time, but I guess that's a good sign you are having me back, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Anytime, and uh, it, it's crazy, like you said, it, time flies, but... I look back and you were actually like one of the first 10 or 15 guests that we had on the show. And we're up to like 160, 170 or something like that now. So we do have some catching up to do since the last time we talked in 2017. Okay. We will cover everything. That's a good sign and great. Awesome. Well, thanks again for having me. For sure. So I mentioned it off the top there. Since we last talked, you have uh, landed in a new job. It's not even really new anymore, but you are the host of Undisputed, uh, Mm -hmm. Skip and Shannon's very popular show on FS1. So let's get right into that. How did that opportunity come about? And how well did you know those two, um, let's say boisterous personalities before Uh, taking that gig? That's a good word for it. You know, uh, crazy, right? It isn't really new anymore. This is my third year hosting Undisputed. And it just, it it does fly by. Um, I had been serving as kind of a fill-in at FS1 for a while. I, I was hired at FS1 kind of with a evolving role that I was doing a lot of different things. And so I was obviously doing sideline for football, um, but I started filling in on more studio shows when uh, all those shows started to launch. So I really was just a a fill in. I would fill in on Colin show. I would fill in with Skip and Shannon, just kind of wherever they needed me. And it was, I don't exactly know when, but Joy wanted to move on from it. And they were, she was really excited about working with Colin and having more of a role in that show. So it just kind of organically, I had sat in that chair. I liked working with Skip and Shannon. I personally, as much as I love sideline, I really like hosting. And I found that hosting is a passion of mine. Like I would love to be able to do hosting and sideline in some capacity. So the reps for Undisputed were really appealing to me to just have that moderator role and manage personalities. And, you know, I like to think I can handle anyone if I can be around Skip and Shannon. So I didn't know the two of them very well initially, other than filling in and having it go smoothly. And it's been solid. And it's just, it's a really, it's a really fun show that keeps me on my feet and you're just able, and I'm, you know, I'm covering everything in a sense. Um, when I'm doing a show like that, I'm in the mix and having those conversations and I really enjoy working with them and they work so hard. The hardest part about the job is waking up at 3.34 every day. Like 
I, I'd be lying to you. Like today, I, I my alarm went off at four and that's sleeping in for me. Typical, like it depends how early I need to get up. And it was just so hard. I was like, I don't want to do this today. Like four is never easy. I don't know how Skip gets there at like three and he's prepping. So it's just crazy. And he's been doing it for how many years? Um, so that's the hardest part about it. But I do enjoy it. That's how I am. Like I cannot consistently, at least at this point in my life, wake up early you know, just on a regular basis. Like if I have to get up for a flight or an appointment, like no problem, but 4 a.m. is is unfathomable to me when like I've slipped into this 8 a.m. <laughs> ritual in COVID. So props yeah. to you. It's not fun. Like, I'm not gonna lie to you. I, I, people are always like, oh, you'll get used to it. I'm like, I don't think you do actually. Like, I really don't think I'm ever used to it. But once I'm there, I'm on, you know, you figure it out, you turn on that adrenaline and um, it's, it is fun to do a daily show. Like I love the hype and preparation for a college football game, but the different grind of a daily show is, is, has been fun. And I think a really good learning experience for me. All right. So you mentioned managing those personalities, obviously Skip Bayless, Shannon Sharp, uh, two big personalities for sure. So, you know, how do you kind of set them up, tee them up for some of the, uh, exciting moments that we see in the show? And then when, things play out, do you kind of know in real time if something is going to do really well in social media or become a meme? Because <laughs> we see memes come out of that show all the time. And yeah. uh, I, I wonder how much of that is, you know, sketched out in advance almost. Honestly, it's not planned out. And I do, I think what's really important to point out from Undisputed is yes, you're going to get the same storylines. Like we're often going to argue about the Cowboys. We're going to talk about Tom Brady. We're going to hit LeBron but the actual arguments themselves are never planned out. So the debates are, are planned out. And yes, you know, Shannon's going to go LeBron and, you know, Skip is obviously not a LeBron guy. Or if you're talking about the Cowboys, you know, the direction we're going to go, but they don't plan it out. I mean, they prepare organically with stats every day. And the meme thing is interesting because I'll randomly show up to work and I'm like, oh, there's a goat today that Shannon's bringing on set. And that's just like, oh, okay. I mean, we don't really have this big organic meeting of planning. Obviously something went into the goat being there, but I, I enjoy how quick witted they both are to the point that it's pushing, it pushes me always because I, I prepare, but the way they just list off numbers. I mean, Shannon has like a photographic memory. His memory and what he can recall from his playing days is incredible. And Skip goes back to stories from 20 years ago and books he's written. I mean, just the way they're able to pull information always blows me away. Um, but the memes are funny. Like I was writing down a couple memes because I was trying to have a TikTok, you know, cause that's what the cool kids do. Oh, yeah. There was a funny TikTok thing going around of like inspirational quotes from random things you've said. So I was writing down just like random things that they say during the show. And it is every day I'm laughing. Like, and you hear me laughing because I'm genuinely laughing. Like Shannon said something during the tournament. It was like, you know, we got these church schools and sometimes divine intervention has taken place. And I'm just like, what? Like, it's just so everything he says and Skip has got, you know, his, I don't lose in these shoes. And there's these sayings that I just, they're ingrained in my brain. Um, and I wish I was as fun and witty as them, but you know, I just try to keep up. Shannon has given me like five different nicknames. And then of course, like Gus Johnson calls me the all American girl. So I've got like Hallmark, Jen, all American girl, jumpsuit, Jen, Jenny from the block. Like there are multiple versions of me, which is kind of fun. Yeah. I, I noticed that on Instagram. I heard that the Gus one, obviously on the games and then Hallmark yeah. Jen noticed on Instagram. And then there was something like in the comments about, uh, cause we know, you know, Shannon likes Henny. So it was like. Uh, oh yes jenny right so that's another jenny one on the henny jenny right. on henny right and that's like i guess my alter ego which i think is fun i love it i mean and people this is funny too like people ask me about the gus thing and it it doesn't offend me at all because gus is known for nicknames like if you get a gus johnson nickname and i've been asked that question i'm like i think it's kind of fun it's a joke like we're playing off of all american girls she's in the stands it's college football like Yes, I am a, I am a woman, but he's not going to say all American woman. Like, I think it's fun. I think you look at Gus, you look at Hollywood, you look at the nicknames he's kind of given out Dicker, the kicker. I mean, I could go on, but I just think it's kind of one of those. It almost to me was like Gus gave me that name and it was a sign of respect in a lot of ways from Gus. So I, 
I think it's fun and I like it. Yeah, I mean, Gus nicknames sayings, they're all electric. And we're going to talk a little <laughs> bit about Gus and Joel uh, yeah. in a little bit here. Yeah. But I do want to, uh, you know, catch up a little bit more with what you've been up to. I uh, saw you on some soccer coverage, obviously, mm-hmm. and um, you were at the World Cup in Russia. And I'm going to work on my French here because I took four years of it Ooh. in high school, but I was never any good. So you were covering uh, Les Bleus, is that right? Le, très bien. Yeah. That was good. Even, I mean, like, just the fact that you're calling them Les Bleus. I mean, Bleu is the same thing in Allez, English. Allez Les Bleus. Right? Allez Les Bleus. Um, très bien. That was good. I liked it. Well, you're a little more polished at French than I am. Um, how did that experience go? You know, I can't even imagine covering a World Cup, like, just in straight-up English. So how did it go <laughs> trying to flip between two languages? That was... a uh, a big challenge for me in a way that now I can look back and I'm so happy it happened. But, you know, the, my role going into the world cup was to travel around with the U S men. And as we know, they didn't qualify. And that was a dark day for U S soccer in a lot of ways. And that was a dark day for Fox. I mean, this is something they'd been building up towards. We'd just come off the women winning the world cup in Canada. And I had traveled around with the women there, which was one of the most rewarding experiences if not the most rewarding, I mean, I'd say that's a highlight. I look back at some of the stuff I've done and I'm extremely blessed. And I think being around the women was so, so special and to share that experience. And so, you know, we were looking forward to to the men and for them not to qualify, it was tough. And I think my role, they were still gonna send me, but I don't have relationships with these international teams, especially not because I'm not covering the game internationally you know, as much as we know how big soccer is everywhere else. Right. So it was a little daunting thinking I was going to go into the world cup and not really know what team I'd be covering. I basically was sent to do sideline. Um, and it's a little different for a world cup, like your access. It's fascinating to be at a world cup, but I didn't know what I was going to be doing. France starts to get going. I covered them early. I speak fluent French. I went to a French school growing up, truly thought it was not fun. I'll be honest. I mean, I remember telling my parents, like, why, like, why are you guys doing this? And my mom was like, it's going to pay off. It's going to pay off. Don't you worry. And I'm so, so glad. And now I always joke with my husband. I'm like, if we have kids that are able to go to an immersion school, wherever we live, we're sending them because it's just been so fun. And he's jealous. Like we've traveled and I can just use my French and it's just been fun. So back to the story, France starts to go on a little bit of a run. I had introduced myself to the press officer, to the players, had covered them early in the tournament. So there were a couple times I would write emails in French. I would remind them like, hey, I do interviews in French. I can do English, whatever you prefer. And it was a little bit of like earning their trust. Um, And I'll never forget. Finally, they were good with me doing an interview with Antoine Griezmann. And I remember at the World Cup, the players will list like French or English in terms of their comfort level for an interview. And I'm waiting for, for Antoine. And I said, French or English after, after the match. And he was like, he literally looked at me like French, like, really? Like, you're going to do this in French. You really think you can do this? And I, it was smooth. I could not translate back in a way that I was confident would be to the standard of television. Like I've literally never done that. And so they would translate for me back to the interview. So I would just ask the question in French and English, let him answer and then continue. And I remember after the interview, he gave me a grin, like, well done. Like I knew that I had to win him over to then win over the press officer to then allow me to do more interviews. So, um, I interviewed Kylian Mbappe and obviously after the win, and it was just it was so cool because I don't think he'd done an interview with any American TV outlets at that point. And he's just an incredible star. And it was in French. And I, I like, I'll never, I'll always remember that moment. And one of my producers who travels with us on college football, his name is Doc, and he was my sideline producer. So he and I had been traveling around Russia together. Thankfully, like, we made it out alive at this point because it was just a whirlwind of a journey. And he was like, I've never seen you so nervous. I mean, I was just, it was just doing an interview after a world cup final in a foreign language. The athletes don't know me. It was just one of those crazy moments. And I'm just so glad it happened that way. And then the next year we were in France for, for the women 
for their World Cup. And then I was able to be more confident. So I did a few more interviews um, at the Women's World Cup in France after, which was pretty cool. So I don't know. I just thank you, mom, for sending me to French immersion. I feel like that was a long story, but it's one of my favorites. So thank you. No, that's awesome. And uh, really serendipitous, you know, silver lining with, yes, the U.S. missed it, but you got to follow the eventual champs. And the next year um, in France, I, I remember the, seeing the Fox set on, on TV oh. early in the summer. And then we were going as a family to, uh, to Paris that, later that year. So I was like, I have to see where that was. And we went to that cafe and it was really Did cool. you? Yeah. Oh, it was, it good. Was, I can't remember the name right now. I don't know if you, you yeah, have. Yeah, Cafe de l'Homme, I believe. Yes, Cafe de l'Homme. Yep. That's yeah. a great. And I have an I have a Instagram picture. It's a great, uh, great flick up spot for IG for sure. Oh, good. Yeah. And like. I look back at how incredible that experience was, right? And just COVID obviously was horrible for everyone, for the world, but I'm so blessed and happy that we were able to have that World Cup experience. And then Fox, I mean, we had the Super Bowl in Miami right before things got really shut down. So there were a lot of really cool moments. And, you know, I'm th hopeful that we'll be back on track for the World Cup, you know, in 2022. But we're still a little bit away. We'll see with the Olympics. I think they're hoping to make it happen just without fans. Yeah, it seems like they're only letting fans from Japan in. But, um, okay. you know, you mentioned these silver linings, right? And and it is great that Fox had, had their big events go forward before the world kind of shut down. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, with, with the past year, year plus, what are some positive takeaways that, you, that you've had uh, you know, while our, our lives have changed. I think one of them for me is, is definitely the opportunity to see my guests on Zoom, uh, <laughs> to meet new people face to face, you know, even if it's not in person, like this was not really a thing before True. COVID happened. And, and now, you know, we get to catch up and I get to do it with, with all kinds of people, maybe even more so than before. So I'm wondering, one, how you kind of cope with um, sports shutdown and how that affected your day-to-day your -day work. And then what maybe you've taken away that wasn't so bad that maybe is here to stay. It's a really good point about zoom right because i i i enjoy so much the interviews one-on-one -on -one with athletes i mean that's really why i love working as a sideline reporter and obviously that wasn't a possibility and i think zoom provided that ability to at least have a face-to-face -face. i mean i did a lot of zooms with justin fields this year and i had you know dog cameos and we were like talking about our dogs and there it just it, you're able to still have that one-on-one -on -one in a way the day I can sit down at Ohio state and have lunch with them again, will be a very special day because one of the reasons, and I know we're going to talk, you know, about Ohio state and how much we're around that program. Right. But like they trust us. And so I would, they, I would be allowed to sit and have lunch with anyone whenever I wanted, whenever we'd go in on Fridays before a game. And the reason it's been so fun to be around that program is because I've gotten to know them so well. So zooms for me were like the closest thing to having that. It's just, you can't zoom with like 10 guys at lunch as easily. So I missed that one-on-one -on -one interaction. Um, but I think the zoom was a great thing and just not taking anything for granted. Like I'm going to look in the stands and look back at some of these, you know, the empty stands was felt so much as a sideline reporter. So when we're able to have fans again, I mean, we're going to appreciate that moment in such a different way. The athletes will, the coaches will, it's not, you know, you take, you do take it for granted. So I think now that we're trending towards that again, like just seeing fans and stands like the Dodgers, I'm, I'm in LA, like they're going to do a celebration today and they have a couple of fans. I don't know. I don't know the number who are going to be able to be there. And like, that's incredible. Like that moment should be shared um, with fans. So we're, we're getting there, but I do think that just, being grateful and thankful and slowing down. There were positives that came with this. I was still able to travel. We made it work. My crew, I'm so grateful that I love my college football crew. Like we get along so well. We didn't need to be going to dinners. We just hung out in the meeting room and we were fine. Like it's just, we were just grateful to be covering the game that we love. And that's what I think the big takeaway was. So you have probably been to a few games with fans. I know you're at some big 12 games as well, right? Yeah, we did have definitely more people at big 12. Yeah, yeah, because, like, I was going to say, I was at the Big Ten tournament for basketball last month, and mm -hmm. just the first time, like, hearing fans again, like, even though it was a like, reduced capacity, was one of those, like, you know, hair stands up in the back of your neck moments. It was very refreshing sure. to, to hear and, like, you know, kind of a full circle thing. Oh, and you realize how much it matters. I mean, momentum shifts 
are a, a, a massive thing, especially for college athletes. I think the NFL, I don't know, it's just a different feel, but I found in college, just having that momentum. And when you lose it and you need that fan base to help you and just keep you going, like I personally felt it a lot, uh, as a sideline reporter, I can't give that energy as the only person. I mean, being the only person in the big house is really weird. Like people are like, Oh, how lucky. And I'm like, this is so bizarre. This is so weird. It's huge. So I'm very excited for more people next season. Yeah, I do think college football was the one sport that suffered the most without fans just because the pageantry is such a big part of the yes. experience. So that's part. Um, all right. I do want to ask about your roots because I know you do have uh, heavy badger roots. <laughs> You're from Minnesota, but uh, we talked about it on the last podcast how you grew up a Wisconsin fan. And I felt like this was a uh, good week to talk about Wisconsin athletics because Barry Alvarez, their longtime athletic director, just hung it up and retired. Um so I'm wondering, you know, with, with being so involved, we talked last time about how your dad was deep in Badger athletics and you had other family members. Did you or your family ever interact with Barry? And, and um, you, you know, either way, what are some of the memories that you take from his run as an athletic director up until just this past week? Yeah, it's really interesting you ask, too, because I had just when we, you know, initially chatted about doing this, I was reading, I had been like reading an article in the athletic about Barry and just his stories are special. So I called my mom and dad who obviously went to Wisconsin. Um, my dad played ice hockey there, which I know, you know, I, and yeah, we would have talked about this, but like he was 73 through 77, they won the national championship, 73, 77. So he like, they didn't, they weren't there at the same time in that era, but he and everyone just respects Barry so much. And even my grandma, who was with my mom when I called, she lived in Madison. So my grandfather was a vice president at the university in the sixties. So my grandma was like, oh, he changed the program around, you know, and she's 90. And so she, it was just cool to get all of these people's kind of just reaction to me mentioning his name. I only know Barry a little bit through being around him with football. It's not like my family has a relationship with him per se, but like the entire, I don't know, just what he did for the program and the turnaround, that's what everyone goes back to and just how he did it. And every time I talk to him, you just get that sense. And he, there's such pride with Wisconsin and Badger athletics. And I am biased, but like, I'm really close with Tony Granado and I'm really close. Well, obviously Paul Christ is so special to get to know, but like, I just have loved the entire athletic group there and they've embraced me. I didn't go to Wisconsin and coach Granado recently asked me to do um, the starting lineup for the hockey team, obviously before the season ended, but he was doing this thing where he'd ask different actors or former players to, to join in. And he, he was like, Hey, can you do this? I'm like, do the players like they don't, what is my relation to Wisconsin? He's like, it doesn't matter. It'll be fun. And he sent me all this Wisconsin gear as a thank you. And like, it's just this family atmosphere that again, like I was not good enough to play ice hockey there. I love Mark Johnson, like so, so happy that the women won again. I am so proud of the success he's had with the women's program, but like, even though I didn't go there, I still feel like I kind of an, am an honorary badger in a lot of ways. So whenever I'm at Camp Randall, it's like so special and full circle to me. And my dad came with me, this would have been two years ago when fans were allowed. And like we were, he was like jumping around on the sideline with me. And I was just, it was one of those moments like, wow, this is really cool. So that was, I went on a tangent. I'm very happy to have gotten to know Barry a little bit and just, it's really impressive to think of all the people he impacted and the way he impacted the program and just like that legacy that he's left. Yeah, no, I've told people and I might've told you when we first talked that I think Madison is the best college town, like in the, in the country and the whole experience goes into, you know, the, the experience being on campus and, you know, the athletics are obviously a huge part of that. Like game day is just so special there. And, um, you know, I, it sounds like you felt that when you went back with your dad. So. Oh, it's the best, right? Like I just, there's nothing like it. And I, my husband, we met at Boston university. He played hockey there and he obviously, he played for coach Granado at the Olympics. And so like they have developed a close relationship, but we joke, we're like one day when we have kids, which again, like I have no kids, I'm already sending them to French school and Wisconsin, but that's definitely on the list because it's the most college 
experience. Like it's just has everything you need. And it's a really hard school though. That's the other thing. I mean, you got to get in, but I'm just impressed by it. And it always makes me feel really special to be around. And, you know, maybe because my grandpa too, who was super into athletics and education, and he was so passionate about university of Wisconsin that it's always fun for me. Like he's kind of proud when he's there, I think in spirit. Yeah. And I know you are, uh, you know, a Minnesota fan as well, <laughs> grown up across the Mississippi and Edina. I know. How can I even say I'm a Wisconsin fan? Like all my Minnesota friends who are gophers are not happy with me. I so. feel like there's more out there than you'd think. Like there's so many that have crossed <laughs> back and forth that secretly, you know, they have the, the loyalties. So I don't think anyone's going to be mad, but you did say, I went back and listened to our conversation and you did say that, um, uh, that you thought PJ Fleck is going to be a big thing for, Minnesota mm-hmm. program. You weren't the only one to think that, but you were spot on when uh, <laughs> you called that. And, and he was big, you know, you got to see yeah. kind of firsthand him taking them to the Outback Bowl. He had a, a great yeah. breakout season in 2019. Um, so here we are, you know, going into the 21 season in a few months here. What's impressed you about your, your hometown Gophers and how far they've come since uh, we talked four years ago? I was looking back to, I was trying to figure out the only time I covered I've only covered the Gophers once since Fleck has been in charge. And I think it was 2018. It was at Ohio state cool game. Ironically, when we were, I was thinking about this, like I went back and listened to my report because I, my brother actually works at Fox and he helps with like production. So he pulled the clip for me and it was cool. It was like the thing Fleck mentioned was about, you know, we're going up against champions, like to be a champion, you have to see the best. And when you're going up against the Buckeyes, you're seeing just this, elite kind of you know team and program and aspiring to that and it was cool he's like we watched miracle before the game and it was interesting to like go back and 2018 feels like a long time ago at this point but just hearing that and i'm i am impressed by the direction the program is going like you mentioned 2019 i think they were averaging like weren't they averaging like over 34 points or i mean it was crazy yeah they have what they were doing they had they had uh those two great receivers you saw tyler johnson win a Super Bowl in his first uh, year out of Minnesota. And then they have oh, Bateman. I was the big right Johnson guy. Yeah. And Bateman, like that's going to be hard to replace in a lot of ways, but I was every day on undisputed when Tyler Johnson was worth mentioning. I'm like, Minnesota's Minnesota's own, you know, I was very proud North of that. Minneapolis, North Minneapolis. Yeah, very proud. Um, but I like him. He actually lives, he lives in Edina, which is where I grew up. And so we, I, the first time we were chatting, we talked about that. Like, I wish I would have, I wish I would have had more time with him at this point because I can't, he's going to his fifth season at this point. Right. Like I haven't spent enough time around him. Um, but I just, I'm excited about the future of the program and hopefully I'll get some games. I think they open against Ohio state, right? I'll still get the schedule, but that sounds right. I know with the week one, uh, I think September 2nd though, I was ran into Joel the other day. I'm like, how do you feel about Minnesota? Cause I haven't covered a game at Minnesota. Like I need to, I need to get home. You just ran into Joel probably on the uh, the beach, some sort of boardwalk over there. <laughs> if only he actually was at Fox. He was do- joining Colin. Um, they love to, you know, get into it and argue all things, uh, which is really fun. I love listening to Joel and I love working with Joel, but he lives a little, he's in Newport. I'm in the South Bay. So we're, we're like 45 minutes apart, but he, he and I have been friends, you know, for years and I love working with him, but yeah, I think September 2nd, I'm pretty sure I checked the schedule and I'm up for it. I don't have any say in this, but I'll be there. Yeah, if you needed. Lobby the bosses. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you spent plenty of time around Ohio State, like we, we touched on yeah. in the beginning of the show. And, you know, a lot of people designate you, Joel, and, and Gus as kind of the honorary Buckeye crew uh, by nature of them being so successful and you guys being the A team. So, what are some of your favorite parts about your many trips now to Columbus, Ohio, outside of the lunches with, um, you know, the Ohio state players? Yeah, I love, I really, really like Columbus. I, uh, again, like all, I, I say these things and I'm like, okay, my Michigan friends are going to be mad at me for saying that my Wisconsin friends, but I really like Ohio state. And like I mentioned, one of the reasons they're so great to be around is the access, but I do think that's come with with trust and, you know, being there so often, but we always stay in this short North area. I believe that's the name. I'm yep. Um, yeah. Near so high it's, street. It's adorable. Right. So mm-hmm. I think we've found, you know, a couple of fun restaurants and I love the hotels we've stayed at and I love the fan base and their passion. And 
I've really, I love the coaching staff. So, I mean, I have loved getting to know Ryan Day. I love Larry Johnson. I mean, he's one of my favorite guys. I love, gosh, Tony Elford and talking about the running backs every day. Like he'll text me the latest with all the running backs. And I just, the reason I like being around them is because of those relationships that we've built along the way. And I'm, that's really special to me, but I, I just really enjoy every time I'm there. Like I get the fan base because one, of course the success, but I understand it a little bit more having been around it. And it always is a place I'm looking forward to going. Definitely. And I think we asked Joel the same question at one point and he, uh, he said Jenny's ice cream was a big tradition. I don't know if that was just a <laughs> nod to you. being. No, Jenny. It's a, I wish, right? Like, well, we spell it differently. I think it's J E N I. Joel and I, that is our like, we do that. We go get ice cream on Friday night and Jenny is being right there. I think he and I have mentioned it so many times in interviews. We're like hoping Jenny's will notice and then just like start sending us ice cream because it's a, it's a tradition. It's a must. It's not a bad plan. There's so many in Chicago. There's so many Jenny's. There's one like around every corner. Really? So, yeah. I'm, I'm on the same page. It's, it's, I, my first apartment was like right down the street from one. So what's your flavor of choice? I don't have one off the top of my head, but I would always get the pints, you know, yeah. the, uh, I couldn't just go for the little scoops cause they do have little scoops there. And, and yeah. I would say that's <laughs> enough. I need a, I need a pint to take home. So yeah, there's one that I like, it's like salted chocolate chip peanut butter or like an almond brittle situation. That's yeah. definitely, yeah, they have, mine. they're a little complicated with the flavors there. So I didn't want to list one and get it wrong, but, um, <laughs> yes, do it right. For sure. Um, and then I did want to bring up one other Ohio State memory. Uh, this one stands out when I, when I was thinking of questions because I do remember you giving a pre-kickoff report, Gus tossed it over to you, and you were in the middle of the Ohio State student section. And they were going nuts, you know, jumping around before kickoff. And I just remember you rattled off a flawless, like, report. And it was pretty long. It wasn't just a, you know, boom, 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 back to you. And that's while everyone's screaming. So that might not be as, you know, tricky as a – interview or report in French, but I am curious <laughs> how you did that while mm -hmm. being surrounded by screaming college students. Well, thank you. That's really kind of you for remembering that. And there's a couple funny angles to that story. I, you know, that game is incredible, right? And, you know, Harbaugh and Urban, they both, they both fell in love with football and coaching because of that game. So I got the idea because both had witnessed the game as kids. Like they were born in the same hospital in Toledo, like months apart, but the, the parallels between the two and just kind of the coaching and the history and the rivalry. Like I got the idea to be in the fan section because I think it was Harbaugh saying like, Oh, I, I saw this game as a kid and I was in love ever since. And then urban would share these crazy stories about it as well. So that's where the idea came from to be in the fan section. And there's just like a level of the adrenaline that I obviously crave and like, and my, I think my producer trusted me, but it was still like, mm, this is kind of a big one to do this for. And I was like, no, don't worry about it. Like I got this. I, I don't ever, I don't like to use notes. I mean, I have notes. I, that's how I remember things, but I don't often need to use them in reports because how I remember stories I remember it in like bullet points. So it's just going to come out some way organically. So the memorization part is not as hard, but it was loud and the screaming was happening, but you just kind of like zoom in and the moment kind of takes over. And it was just such a fun challenge. Right. And I ended up doing it again for red river a little bit, but I think for whatever reason that one specifically stood out and I made the mistake of wearing, which I thought was a color that would not be an issue. I looked back at pictures. I was wearing a hat. It was cold. It's the game. It's freezing. It's like gray, green, like a light green. Like it was a neutral white. And then there was a gold, like little bit of gold in the hat. And these Ohio state fans, you would have thought I was in full on Michigan gear. Like they were like, we're going to take your hat off. Like, why are you wearing that? Like, this is, this color is not a big deal. Like, what are we talking about here? People were really mad about the hat. I've posted pictures since, or I went back at my comments and people were furious about that. I normally am better than that. Like I know colors enough to make a smart choice. I don't think I've worn the hat since. That's so. the same school though, that if you're wearing blue at practice, they'll, they'll try and make you change. So I'm not. Oh, not I know. 
Yeah, they are not happy about it. We had a producer who was wearing, and I don't think he'll care if I tell this story because it's still funny to me. He was wearing a Seahawks like pullover. Like this is like a pro team. Like an urban was like, is that blue? Like it, it was like a Navy, but it had Seahawks. Like it was so far from anything Michigan. And he asked him to change. And I love that. I think it's just like a great part of the rivalry. Yeah, before the first time I went to practice there, I came down in a blue ETN polo to, to the lobby. Oh, I was like, no, yeah. you can go change that. And I, I didn't know if they were joking or not, but no, I guess it's like a real thing. It's a real As thing. That's that, by your story. <laughs> they were so mad about this hat. But thank you for pointing out that you like the report. That makes me really happy. And the day I can be in the middle of fans screaming in a packed house, let's, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it every time at this point. Yeah, can't wait for that. Um, and you know, before we we wrap up, I, I do want to get one more question about your crew. And mm. Gus and Joel and you are, are uh, you know very entertaining, and and I feel like you've peeled back the curtain at times. You know, whether it's a, a picture on on a Friday walkthrough or or just you know the stories that come out. <laughs> but what uh what is something about Joel and Gus? Maybe a tradition, or maybe something that they do. Like we all see them do the fist bump and all that in the booth, but maybe what's something they do during game week that the audience might not know. Okay. That's fun. Um, so gosh, the tree, the tr I love working with the two of them and this is going to be our fifth season, which is crazy. Time does fly, but, and I, I want to give the love too to like our producer, Chuck McDonald. He's been working on this crew for, I think they're at like 10 years now. Um, Rich Dewey was the director. Like we are like a little family. So I love our entire crew gets along so well from our camera guys to audio. Like this is such a special niche group that like I genuinely love working like Trey who does my audio on the field, like best guy ever love him. So anyways, it's not almost just Joel and Gus and I, it's like everyone, but this is a funny thing that started this season. I don't know if it's come out, but Gus traveled with his dog this season. So he has the cutest little Frenchie named Bo. I think it's Bo. Now I feel bad. I feel like it's Bo. I need to like text him and make sure. Cutest dog ever, but he would come with him like in the booth at times. And Joel, who doesn't have a dog, like was just like, how oh, we got a dog in here. Like it was so fun, but everyone fell in love with Gus's dog because how can you not fall in love with a Frenchie? So that was like a bright light in this crazy COVID year where we just like really enjoyed this little dog in our meetings and he was just like so fun to have around and I ended up getting him a little Michigan collar because you know Gus's ties to Michigan like being a Detroit guy and um that was kind of fun this year but like Friday night we always we eat together as a crew like the meeting rooms we always have dinner and we just it's just like a big family and there's not necessarily traditions as much as Joel and I always getting ice cream and like Gus is probably too healthy for the ice cream always he doesn't always join us but just the camaraderie of like getting to the game in the morning and, you know, going over pronunciations and just like the routines we have. And I just, now I'm getting so excited about it. Like I so look forward to that and it doesn't really feel like a job when you're working with people that you like so much. So. Yeah. You mentioned Gus's eating habits. I just realized you kind of work with like the, <laughs> the healthiest, most fit people on the planet. Like Shannon, I know. Like Gus, Joel played sports, I guess, you know, it's crazy. Like Skip and Shannon are so healthy it's crazy. Skip allows himself one piece of pizza on Friday night, which he told me he was going to get today. And I'm like, who has ever eaten this one slice of pizza? Like that's not even, I don't eat, that's like more punishment to me than eating no pizza just to eat one, um, which is crazy. And then Gus is super healthy. Joel's doesn't skip a workout. Like he works out. We were doing all the noon games, right? Like Joel's working out before the game. And I'm just like, I'm going to get my steps in on the field, but I do work with very fit. And I played a sport. Like I played lacrosse in college. I'm not like, I like working out, but there's a level of, I'm going to be okay on Saturday morning at 5 a.m. I'm going to skip it. Yeah. And you're on point with the one pizza, uh, you know, one yeah. pizza. Nobody, you can't eat one slice. Like it's terrible. No. You gotta Shannon go has two a days. Like he's crazy. They're all crazy. I, and I'm literally going to go take a nap right now after this. <laughs> I made it wake up at three. So uh, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but I do want to ask, you know, since you've been to some big games in the last four seasons, four or five seasons, 
Um, do you have a top three that you can list of the top Big Ten games you have worked mm -hmm. and attended? So I was thinking about this because it's hard. Like, there's so many good games. 2017 would have been my first Michigan Ohio State game. It was incredible. It was incredible uh, at the big house. I have never been more nervous for. Well, that's not fair. I would probably say I was more nervous with the French interview, but at that time, just the the heightened excitement that Fox had this game and it was a big deal. And I was I was pretty nervous before that, but it was a very like oh my gosh, this is your dream job and you're doing it moment for me. So I'm always going to remember that. Um, there was that Penn State, Ohio State game in 2017 with JT Barrett, yes, right? Okay, that was 2017. Yeah. I could not find him. So I'm like sprinting down the field, trying to get an interview. The camera's coming down, the sky cam, the fans are storming. And it was just like, where is JT? Like, And it was just... Thank goodness I found him. Like I, I, I should actually ask them about that because I don't even know how I found him, but I, we did thankfully, because that was such a cool moment. Just, you know, anytime we're storming the field, it's a more, it's a moment, but, um, that interview just and how special that was. And like JT and I always chat and we have kind of kept a good relationship and I saw him at a game. Gosh, I don't know. It would have been two years ago. Cause if it was the fans were there, and we talked about that interview and that moment. And so that was really fun to me. And then the other one that really stood out to me, and you remember that game. Yeah, you're talking about the, uh, the JT Penn State one? Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah, it, was, it was insane. That was the same one that Saquon Barkley ran the kickback, I think. Right? Insane, yes. And it was silent. Like the silence from the fan base when he did that. And that was just such a moment. Good memory. I was like, there was so much more from that game. And it well, was just special. Penn State was like unstoppable at that point. And yeah. it seemed like they were going to go maybe to the playoff. And, and uh, Saquon was like Heisman front runner. And that kickoff was just like, wow, they're going to, they might roll here. And then That's what State, it was. those games are always great with Ohio State. So wasn't oh, that was such a good one. That was so good. And then my other one that I got to point out is I, the first time I got to cover Iowa was 2018. It was against Wisconsin, and I think Wisconsin won late. It ended up being a really good game, but like seeing the wave for the first time, I just like there's nothing better in in college football, in college sports, maybe in sports. Like that is the most touching. I randomly watched the story we did on it on the wave. I'm not exactly sure why I pulled it up. I was explaining it to someone, and I mean, there's nothing better. It's the coolest, most. It just makes you feel like there's so much more that's more important than what we're doing and the wave, like you can't not get emotional. And I just, everything about being there is special. And so that was 2018 when I saw it for the first time and it's like ingrained in my brain the moment. So yeah. Kinnick stadium is really cool. So those are in order because we're going to put a graphic out and you're going to oh. hear it from. Yeah, that's right. Okay. All Cause right. I mean, I got to say the game first, like it was just one of those, like, Whoa. So it goes one, two, then three then. So the game yeah. number one, got it. All right, we're going to put that out and have the fans dissect it, and it'll be fun. Um, <laughs> well, and oh, and wait, I'm trying to – the other thing that's crazy, though, 2018, when I did the report, that was the year – it was the revenge tour. Yes. So that was like the Chase Winovich, like, revenge tour. So now I'm like, ooh, was that one – I mean, it, the game wasn't great, though. That was 56. had a lot of injuries. Yeah, I think it was like a – it ended up being a, a kind of a blowout. Yeah, but the, okay, so I think we still need to keep the first one I ever covered because it was just the full on Fox had the game and we were just so excited about it. But yeah, okay, I can't change it now. Keep it. Oh, it's locked in. <laughs> um, so Jenny, I have to thank you first of all because we went way over the time here and that's great. Like we, we want uh, oh, more, I didn't even the more content, the better, the more discussion, the better. Um, it, was, it was a blast, but I also have to thank you for one more thing. Um, so back in October, I think it was, you guys had your first trip to my hometown, Champaign, Illinois, for mm -hmm. Ohio State, Illinois. Yeah. Um, and that game ended up being canceled. I was actually in town uh, by coincidence, and, and I was looking forward to that game. Well, and, thanks. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I, was, I was excited for you guys to finally get to call a game at Illinois at my alma mater. And then the game gets called off, and Joel is, is popping off in his hotel room, and he's like tweeting like he might as well have been stranded in Siberia. He's like, I can't believe this. The game's canceled i'm paraphrasing here but he's he's uh you know like i said acting like he, there's no worse place to be stuck and 
I didn't see the same from you. So I'll at least thank you for, you know, um, not putting my hometown on blast like that. Well, I know that Joel was just so excited for it. That was the part that was so emotional, but I liked, I'd actually never been there. I mean, for, I think the, the hardest part about all of that was just the overall disappointment because we wanted to see Ohio state and COVID and the, you know, the crazy year that the buck has had to deal with. And we were all just like devastated because we, we kind of were worried about it going into it. I liked it there. I, I had a lovely hotel experience. Um, I haven't gone back since, but I think I have a feeling that if I go again, it'll be positive. So don't worry. No angry tweets coming from me. Maybe you can give me like a personal tour. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you an itinerary. And uh, hopefully, you know, with, with their new hire, they can get some more primetime games and get the program turned around. And I'm just messing with Joel. Like, he's been on the show a few times, and when he comes back, I'll give him a hard time about it. So you don't need to defend him. Oh, I know. Well, you know what I mean. I mean, it was just like the emotion of that week and Thanksgiving. And all, the, the point, all of us just wanted to watch football. And we're like, no, I it wasn't that we were there. I mean, we got canceled in Baylor this year. Like if, whatever I get on a plane. I mean, I was devastated for the players and I tweeted that a couple of times, like this season and the wear and tear on them. Like I will give them credit until the end. And I think we looked like we were talking about Minnesota and you know, their record. And I'm just like COVID year. The fact even that coaches were fired after this year is a crazy thought to me because there was just so much working against the athletes and the players and the coaches. And I'm so impressed by the the ability to get it done. I mean, we had a season, thank God, right? I mean, it was just the sacrifice from the players this year will forever be so impressive to me. And I just like don't think that can be stated more. And I think it has come out more, but like we just what they were going through and the testing and the being careful and not seeing their families. And like, that was a true test. And I was just impressed by their kind of will to, to make sure they could play. Yeah. Yeah. So well said, uh, appreciate it as always. And thank you, you know, like I said, for giving me a bunch of time, whenever you're on the, the games or on TV, um, I'm like, Hey, there's Jenny. She's nice <laughs> never. And you know, that, that, uh, stayed true to this interview and I'm not surprised. So thank yeah, you. no, really appreciate it. And, um, you know, looking forward to, to following, looking forward to, like you said, throughout this interview, getting back to normal and having fans and having football and all that good stuff. So appreciate it, Jenny. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. We'll uh, chat next season. All right. All right. Thanks once again to Jenny for joining me. Um, always one of my favorite discussions, guests to have on. Just, uh, you know, really genuine person who has a lot of great stories and really, uh, cool insights from a really successful career so far in the sports industry. So excited to continue to follow her as uh, her career, you know, undoubtedly stays at the top of uh, the sports field. So great stuff from Jenny. And we'll move on now to Harold Shelton, Big Ten Network's manager of research. If you are unfamiliar with the show layout, we generally have Harold on in the middle of football and basketball season to talk about what's going on on the court, on the field. And Harold is a uh, is really adept at explaining what is going on to us average sports fans like myself. And uh, he's blessed with the ability to take the stats, the numbers, the trends on the field, and uh, relay it to a podcast audience. So now with no sports going on, um, or at least the sports that we focus on mainly on the show in men's basketball and football, Harold and I are getting into some off-season topics. We'll continue to probably do so throughout the spring and summer. This week's topic, we decided, and we'll get into it more in depth here in a moment, is uh, going to focus on Big Ten coaches in football and basketball for the last 25 years or so. And we do some fun rankings, and um, I'll let Harold get into it now instead of continuing to drag it out here. So let's get right to it. Take 10 Podcasts weekly discussion with Harold Shelton. All right, we're back in the lab with Harold Shelton, BTN Manager of Research. H, how's it going here on a rainy end of the week in Chicago? This should drop uh, hopefully in a sunnier early next week. I'm doing fine. You know, um, I know we had rain in the 50s uh, today, but uh, considering the previous few days, I'll, I'll take that in a heartbeat. I was able to actually sit outside and you know have a couple of libations on the deck. So things are all right for me. Yeah, I did. Broke out the outdoor patio furniture. Got some new uh, new tables and chairs set up. So I've been working outside a little more, especially when the weather allows. But 
you know, that, that spring for you when, when one day it'll be 75, maybe close to pushing 80, and the next it's 48 and, and uh, cloudy, rainy, and nasty. So um, spring also means that we got to get a little more creative with our, our topics since all our Big Ten teams are, are done. So we've talked about it. Uh, I think we came up with some good ideas here, uh, and I say we, really you. Um, so fill the audience in here on, on what we might get into in a little bit here on the, on the show. Yeah, so we were just kind of throwing throwing some things out there. Um, I would, I looked and I saw uh, Scott Docterman from The Athletic uh, did a piece on the 40 Big Ten football hires that have happened uh, since Kirk Ferentz was hired in 1999. And, and he ranked them uh, one through 40. And, you know, I, I agreed with a lot of the list. There were some I thought might have been too low, some that might have been too high, but um, it's the perfect, you know, article to get the people going, you know, your water cooler talk uh, type conversation that kind of drives content in the summer, spring and summer when it's a little slower. So uh, that was kind of the premise for what we're about to talk about now. Yeah, so great idea from Scott and really well researched and, um, you know, put together an article. So this is not plagiarism. We're going to we're going to uh, definitely full encourage credit everyone. Scott. Yeah, full credit to Scott. We're going to push everyone to read his article in the athletic because it does go one through 40. We're only going like one through 10 plus some honorable mentions that we'll add in our top football hires since 1999. And then uh, we also have the idea to include basketball in here as well. So we will do our top 10 basketball hires and uh, to kind of keep it consistent with a very uh, important, significant hire that kind of kicks us all off. We started with Izzo in, um, was it 95? When he was yeah, the 95-96 uh, season. We wanted to go ahead and, you know, have the dean of Big Ten coaches for both sports is kind of the jumping off point. Um, and we'll see where they land in our rankings. All right, love that. Real quick, though, keep this consistent with our recent previous episodes where we offer some thoughts on our guest of the week. This week's is Jenny Taft. So uh, just got done talking to her. And, you know, someone I've, I've known now for a few years loosely um, and I've gotten to know her a little better through the podcast. And, since we met like four years ago, almost four years ago, it was a Big Ten Media Day in 2017. Uh, her career is like skyrocketed. Um, she was already in a good spot at that point, but she's way more high profile now. So, uh, you know, I know she's not a former Big Ten athlete or, or somebody that we have talked about, you know, each time on the show when I bring up the guests and you kind of reminisce on their playing days. Not the same sort of context here, but, you know, if you want to offer some thoughts on Jenny Taft, you have the floor. Yeah, if somebody I, I certainly would like to meet, I haven't met uh, them like you have, but uh, I'm always a fan of people finding a lane, um, people that were given an opportunity and have been allowed to thrive in it. Um, you know, she hosts Undisputed. She's the top reporter for the Fox College Football, you know, does a lot for us uh, at Big Ten whenever we have a, a big noon game or something like that. And she's a huge part of that coverage as well. Uh, so definitely shout out to Jenny Taft. She does a lot of good work, um, and, and I do enjoy her reporting. All right, yeah, a couple of fans right here. Definitely a big fan of what she's done, and she's really owned the um, the Fox Sports space. Like you said, just two most prominent roles. Um, you know, a woman in those prominent roles is, is great to see. So agreed on that front. And, um, again, shout out to her for jumping on. We will get now, Harold, to our list, and we'll start with football and kind of – like you alluded to, launch off Scott Docterman's list in um, The Athletic. And I think number one is probably unanimous. Um, we'll go one, you know, one through 10 on his and kind of offer what we would have or any changes we'd make. And then once we get to basketball, we can go through our own personal list. But did you ever admire as well, or did you agree with that pick at number one? Yeah, I did. Um, I could see an argument for one other guy um, but I think if you look at the totality of everything and how Urban impacted the league once he got here, I think it was uh, a good decision to have him one. Would D'Antonio be your number one? No, 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 no. It would have been – it was an Ohio State guy either way. It was either Urban or Trestle, uh, Trestle two national two. championship coaches. Um, and, you know, a lot of people kind of forget toward the end of the John Cooper years, things weren't really rolling for Ohio State coming into the new century and, you know, Trestle did the promise of, you know, we're going to go up to Ann Arbor and we're going to win that game. And, you know, he was responsible for turning that Ohio State-Michigan rivalry on its head. 
and to win a national title in year two. I could see the argument for it, but I think Urban impacted the league more as a whole. Yeah, so we had Urban and Tressel one too. So I think I'm in agreement that those could both go interchangeably is what you're saying. Mm-hmm. But yeah. I, I, if you ask me tomorrow, Saturday, I'd probably still say Urban, maybe Sunday I'd say Trestle. But more often than not, it's going to be Urban Meyer at one. All right. I don't think you'll disagree with the number three here. Could be wrong. But the aforementioned D'Antonio checked in at number three on his list. If you don't just want to run through those accomplishments that he had and and uh, make a case as to why you, I assume, agree with this, um, let me know. Yeah, I definitely think he's three. Um, you know, if he had won a national title, you know, maybe he could have been hired in Trestle. But I mean, this is a program that had no direction, really. It was, you know, they beat some teams, you know, they'd lose some games they shouldn't lose. They'd upset some people they shouldn't upset. You know, you win seven games, you win five games, you win nine games, you win six games. There was no consistency at all. Uh, if he gets there. They win three Big Ten titles. They win a Rose Bowl. They win a Cotton Bowl. They get to the playoff. You know, I think it was five or six, uh, 10 win seasons, you know, three top six finishes, stuff that you hadn't seen from Michigan State since like integration of college football, like 1960s type stuff. The fact that he had them in such rarefied air with the Clemsons, Alabamas, Oklahomas for the middle of that decade was impressive stuff. Yeah, you kind of forget, um, or at least I do how impressive that run was at times I you know going to their practice facility out there they have a list of just like the bowl games and that kind of opened my eyes every time I saw that like you mentioned uh, you just rattled off all those bowl games that included college football playoff uh, BCS slash um, New Year's Six type bowls and, and it was just year after year and it, it's crazy what he did to elevate you know it was a pretty average program I still remember like John L. Smith or whatever smacking himself in the press conference and that was like Michigan's football for a while yeah absolutely I mean I was a student for uh, Bobby Williams and John L. Smith. So I saw the highs and lows of that where, you know, they can go out and beat, you know, a top five Wisconsin team by 35 and then turn around the next week and lose to an unranked Penn State team by double digits and miss a bowl game. Like that's just kind of what Michigan State was for the better part of 30, 40 years until D'Antonio got it rolling. All right. So none of those three coaches are still there. His number four and five are and six and seven and eight are still there um, in their current position so let's start with four and I don't really have an argument here um again if the first two to three weren't so legendary like this would be a, a top hire in a lot of leagues uh Kirk Ferentz in 99 and um that's like you said where he kind of kicks off the list especially with his Iowa connection um with Scott Dockerman doing the Iowa coverage at the athletic at the athletic yeah I I wanted to put one guy ahead of him but as I looked further I couldn't do it um, I had to remember, you know, kind of how he got Iowa back to the way it was in the 80s. Um, the fact that he was able to, you know, win Big Ten titles, uh, the longevity in general, because he was a downturn there for a while. Um, I'd say right around, you know, the start of the 2010s, there wasn't a lot going on. And then like kind of this crescendo again to where, you know, they're, they're in the top 25 every year. You know, they're a play away from making the college football playoff. Now they're winning a bunch of bowl games again, and they're always a threat in the West. So I got to give Kirk Ferentz that number four spot. So who would you put ahead potentially? What is it, Fitzgerald? It was Fitz, yeah. All right, that, that's his number five. And, yeah, like, I kind of agree that you could make a case just because of the lift that was done there. But I also remember, you know, I talked to Anthony Heron plenty of times and like you see how bad Iowa was during his freshman year. And um, that was also a, a, a project, even though Iowa had the foundation. So if it's at five, you have no problem with that. No, no, I think, uh, you know, he's the second longest tenured guy on this list. Uh, the fact that he's got Northwestern, you know, a quarter away from a couple of Big Ten titles. You know, I mean, he went toe to toe with Ohio State team. Uh, that, you know, was the second best team in the country. And, you know, they had them on the ropes. And the fact that now that you expect them to win bowl games before they hadn't won anything, you know, and now they're consistently winning bowl games. They're consistently in the mix. They never have top recruiting classes, but yet they still find a way to win. And he's a master in close games. Like they, if Northwestern gets you in the fourth quarter of a sloppy game, you're probably going to lose. That's just what it is. And so I think Fitz's coaching has a lot to do with that. 
Yeah, for the top five, I really have no argument really uh, strong either way. I think it's a it's a solid top five. So shout out Scott. Scott's been on the show um, a while ago. I think we had him on in the early early days, but um, I followed him since then. You know, brilliant writer, obviously. And uh, his six through ten are slots where I could see you know some shifting going on I, I i have a feeling your list might vary a little bit from from his uh but he had james franklin at number six which like i don't know who i would put over him necessarily uh but as we get deeper into this there are some that i, I think i would switch around but did you have franklin at six or did you uh disagree yeah I, this is where the disagreement starts with me um it's kind of a forgotten name a little bit uh well at least until recently uh as your coach now i had brett bielham a six um, I think a lot gets lost um, just because he took over from Barry Alvarez. But the fact he, he comes right in, they go 12 and one his first year. Then, you know, win nine games. They start winning bowl games again. Then you go 10 wins, 11 wins, 11 wins. And then in 2012, you wind up winning the Big Ten again. So you win three Big Ten titles. You have, you know, what, five top 25 finishes, make three Rose Bowls. I think that's just more than what James Franklin has done so far. Fair enough. Where did you have Franklin move down to? I have Franklin at eight. Okay. So Scott had uh, one of Bielema's successors, Paul Chris, at number seven. And I wasn't sure about this one just because even though Wisconsin did have some tougher times uh, after Bielema left for Arkansas, you know, there, there was still a pretty solid foundation. The program was in a great spot, you know, pretty much since, you know, Barry took over. And I just didn't know if that was, um, if that was a point where you want to put guys who have taken over for proven models or honestly, like when I go down the list and guys who didn't crack the top 10, but I would personally have considered, especially if they had sustained their momentum into the most recent seasons, like you're looking at guys like uh, Fleck and Brom, not quite that high, but I thought they'd be knocking on the door of the top 10. Um, you know, I would, I would almost be tempted to put a Tom Allen up near, if not, you know, where James Franklin was, maybe where in, in, in lieu of a Paul Chris at number seven or eight. Uh, I don't know if he's going to appear later in your rankings, but I, as we got deeper into it, um, I started leaning away from guys who kind of took over the proven model, took the keys, if you will. Yeah, I think we had a similar thought process on that. Um, I did have Chris on my list, but he was nine on mine. Um, I actually had a conversation with a friend of mine who had Tom Allen in his top 10. Um, I didn't quite have him there, but he was certainly in consideration. I think if they would have won the bowl game, he might have been. Uh, that's kind of the, the one last thing he hasn't been able to do at IU, but I think there's still room for him to climb that list the same with a PJ Fleck um, and maybe even Paul Chris, if they, you know, wind up winning the big 10 or, you know, win a Rose bowl, something like that. But for right now, I think Paul Chris at nine uh, kind of for the reasons you mentioned. All right. So we had Ryan day at eight. How do you feel about a, a third Buckeye coach in the eight spot? I actually had a day between Bielema and Franklin. Okay. Um, and I know we had, we just talked about like taking over, the you know already established programs but one thing i've noticed with ryan day and you know urban meyer kind of had this issue in the past and it's you know we don't really talk about it as much because they because he won so much and you know he only lost what nine games or whatever it is but the timing of those nine games cost them even more hardware like the 2015 michigan state loss probably shouldn't have happened the, the Iowa loss where they give up 55, the Purdue loss where they give up 49, like those losses shouldn't happen when you're at Ohio State. And Ryan Day hasn't had a loss like that. He's been able to keep the team focused and pedal to the metal, you know, every time out. So two Big Ten titles, uh, they get to a national championship game, probably should have gotten the two. You know, we've, we've been over to Sean Wade calling all that from the year before against Clemson. Uh, so I think the fact that he's been able to take over from Urban but still do it his way, you know, I think he should get a lot of credit for that. Yeah, I've said a lot on here that I really do like Ryan Day. And I agree, you know, even though I just ranted about 
guys being handed the keys. I, I agree, he probably falls somewhere in this top 10. Um, he did have Scott had uh, Bielema at nine, so he did, uh, he wasn't on your wavelength there. And I, I don't disagree with having him in there somewhere. I guess I, I was kind of ignorant to the history of, of that transition between Barry and Bielema and what was at stake there. Uh, and then it, interestingly, he has Harbaugh at 10, which like I, I, I don't really disagree that he is a top 10 influential hire in this time period. I mean, like disagree or not with um, his success, Michigan is extremely relevant still, like very national team by virtue of Harbaugh being the head coach. Like it's not a Rich Rod, um, what was the other guy, Brady Hoke situation. Um, since Lloyd Carr, even though they uh, was there, even though they struggled to have, um, you know, consistent winning, at least in the postseason or beating Ohio State, they're still a national program. And that's because Jim Harbaugh is the coach. Yeah. And, you know, when I first saw the list, I'm like, Harbaugh at 10, like that feels high. And then I, I was going through the rest of the hires and I'm like, well, I can't put him ahead. I can't put this guy ahead. I can't put that guy ahead. And so I kind of fell on the same thing. And the other part, and this kind of goes, you know, back to what we were saying, he did take over a situation where Brady Hoke and Rich Rod kind of had it off the rails for a while and they weren't relevant nationally and they weren't even relevant in the Big Ten. And so the fact that he got there and now they finished in the top 24 times, um, the fact that, you know, they're getting nine, 10 wins, you know, a year. And obviously the Ohio State issue is still there. The fact that they haven't been to Indy is still there. And that probably means that he could be higher if he would have, you know, done one of those two things. But I think he's done enough to the point where people behind him can't jump him at this point. Yeah, kind of a victim of his own success and expectations. And some of the, and a lot of those are, you know, self-imposed for sure, uh, just by nature of who he is. But like you said, they, he has elevated them uh, to that level for sure. But being a Super Bowl coach and and being the Michigan man and having these standards and, and you know, you go in the building and they have like all these mantras and things like that. And it's a very Michigan football vibe and experience. And, uh, you know, any Michigan fans listening are probably like, guy doesn't know what he's talking about but that's just the, the outside uh perspective that i that i glean from the whole situation so uh it's gonna be really interesting to see like where they go now you know the vote of confidence is, is in for him um and then to round out this list that was number 10 so we talked about guys that could potentially sneak in uh scott had bill o'brien at 11 um and then i mentioned some guys like tom allen pj fleck and brahm and i think any of those guys maybe could have snuck in if you like, if you said Tom Allen would have won the bowl game, or even though you know one game shouldn't determine that, but maybe another year of, of success there uh, under Allen would do it. Or if Purdue had kept accelerating after that breakout year where they beat Ohio State, or if Minnesota hadn't regressed as much as they did last year, and maybe have another year to build on that outstanding season from a couple of years ago. I think there's a few that are knocking on the door that are like transformational coaches program wise and they could very well be that but because that hasn't happened I think that's why we have a lot of uh you know repeat schools in this in this uh this list or at least Ohio State has three coaches uh Wisconsin has two and Penn State almost has two in the top 10. Right um a thing I've noticed about this list too is this it seems like a lot of the, the pre-Big Ten network hires weren't as good as some of the the post Big Ten network hires um, obviously, you've got Ference and you've got Trestle and you know, I think Bielema and uh, Fitz are kind of right on the cusp there. But, you know, you look at Antonio, Urban, Day, Franklin, Chris, Harbaugh, like all of these are within the last, you know, six, seven, eight years. And then you add O'Brien, Fleck, Allen. It looks like schools have done a much better job of finding a guy to lead their program. Um, I'm not sure if there's a tie there in terms of the timing of it, but it seems like, uh, you know, the Big Ten is as strong as it is now and probably as strong as it's ever been because guys have made really good hires. I, I really wanted to, to find a transformational hire. Like I saw Randy Walker was a little further down on the list and I know his record wasn't as good, but the fact that he impacted the Big Ten the way he did. Um, you know, with the spread offense, doing it the way that they did it, you know, it's a little, little different than Joe Tiller. You know, the fact that they were able to do a spread 
and be able to run the ball so well is something that the Big Ten never saw. Um, and I think Bill O'Brien definitely deserves a lot of credit. He was 12 on my list um, because he basically saved the Penn State program. Right. That if he doesn't have those two years of keeping things afloat for Franklin to take it to another level, who knows where Penn State would be or how long it would have taken him to get back. And when was Tiller hired? I had, uh, I had admitted him for my original. No, it was, it was before this list. It was before. Right. Was right. But... Okay. I was going to say, that's what I thought. And I know he, he's old. He passed away um, semi-recently mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years ago, but, um, but yeah, I mean, obviously he's another one of those coaches transformational uh, in nature. Um, yeah, but yeah, I agree. I, th I, I don't think it's an accident. Like I think the, the floor has been raised since the big 10 network era. I could definitely say in the last, you know, probably five to seven years, a lot of that has to do with revenue. Um, and it's some of it's confirmation bias just because like I've noticed it more because I've, I've worked here the last four to five years, but um, just with the, you know, the level of hires that have, have happened for the most part and just the quality of teams overall, I think has, has been boosted. So I, I don't think that's a coincidence that it seems like the BTN era hires um, are a little, have a little more sizzle behind them. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think uh, the revenue is a big part of it now because between that and the way that Urban came in and kind of changed the philosophy of recruiting and you know, no more gentlemen's agreements and all that stuff when it come to when it came to getting kids and kind of being more national with things. Um, and now that the money is what it is, you can hire big not big time assistants. You can give coordinators raises where they're making seven figures now and they don't have to go somewhere else. And so you can and a Jeff Brown situation where he might have left to go to Louisville and Purdue had the money to pony up to keep him. You know, I don't know if those things happen uh, before Big Ten Network. So it looks like the schools that are getting the money, they're taking advantage of it. And, you know, the facilities are better. You know, we're, we're seeing a Big Ten as strong as it's ever been. I do think a revenue uh, is a big part of that. All right. So let's switch to basketball now. We go a long time on these, I'm sure. Uh, but I want to keep it somewhat contained uh, time wise. So should pivot and like we mentioned at the top we did scale this back four years to 95 to include Izzo um just because he has been the best coach uh I think we both agree in the Big Ten in that in the last two decades and that's why he's number one on my list I yeah, talking to a Spartan um I can't imagine that you disagree nah that that, that was an easy easy pick there um you know again we did it to you know, kind of have the dean of both sports in terms of Big Ten coaches. So that's why we picked Izzo, and it was around the 25-year mark. Um, you know, the, the accomplishments speak for themselves. He's getting ready to pass Bob Knight and wins, uh, eight Final Fours, 10 Big Ten titles. Um, you know, he's, you know, he's done, you know, he's probably the second best Big Ten coach of all time. All right. Who'd you have for two? Because I had Beeline. Um and I, I thought two through four or five were pretty all, uh, all pretty close. And, you know, I think I, I had Beeline just because he went on an Izzo-like run, despite not, you know, coming close to touching the eight Final Fours. He not only did he go on an Izzo-like run of winning for, you know, a decade plus, but he also kind of resurrected a program that was really going through some hard times trying to rediscover, you know, some of that greatness from the 80s and 90s. And, you know, just the job he did in Michigan was outstanding. I, I am curious as to where you had him on your list. I actually had Beeline 4 on my list. And okay. I thought I was going to have him higher until I looked a little deeper into it. Um, but I just didn't think in terms of the Big Ten titles, he didn't measure up to the two guys, well, the three guys I had ahead of him. Um, obviously, great job getting the two championship games. Um, to your point, resurrected the program that was lost in the wilderness for over a decade. Um, you know, he's got the coach of the year. We've we've seen now that it's you, now it's been two Michigan schools that do work in March, and before it was just one. And now, you know, you when you think of Michigan, you think of you know deep tourney runs, and you think of you know success and, and conference titles and conference tourney titles, and none of that happens without Beeline. Um, but I had him behind a couple of other guys on my list. This is why I'm not a big J journalist. I can be compromised, right? Beeline's just nice to me, and I work with him. So Beeline, the awesome Ooh, dude. Number two. <laughs> for me, Who's number two. Number two for me, um, and it's hurt to say this because for a while I could not stand 
Um, just for as a fan, like I don't know him personally, but uh, I have Bo Ryan. Um, when I was a student, Wisconsin was our biggest rival, more so than Michigan and hoops because of Bo Ryan. And the fact that he took that program from just, they didn't have a ton of success. You know, they have some guys here and there, but nothing crazy. And he wins four Big Ten titles and he wins three conference tournament titles. And for a while, it was the whole, well, you know, he does good in the regular season, but in the NCAA tournament, he doesn't really do a whole lot. Then he gets the back-to-back Final Fours. He's a few curious calls away from winning a national title. And who knows if Aaron Harrison doesn't make the shot, maybe they win it in 2014 as well. Um, Four-time coach of the year. He never finished below fourth in the league when he was there. So just the fact that he found such sustained success for as long as he did, had him number two on my list. Yeah, that's that's tough to argue with. And, you know, maybe if I were to redraw it, I, I could put him second. I actually had him fourth on mine, which seems kind of unfair after all the things you just listed. Um, who did you have third? Because I'm because uh, you said you had beeline four, so that means you must have had uh, Thad Mata third, right? I did. Okay, we, we're in agreement there. And honestly, I could see a case to switch any of two, three, and four and rearrange them. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, what Mata did, and just because of his abrupt kind of departure, it seems like it gets lost a little bit and people kind of forget. And Chris Holtman's, like, kept up the the level, not quite to what Mata, Mata did. But, um, you know, it's still a very successful program there. But you kind of forget how great Mata was very quickly there in short order and how long they kept it going. Like, he, he, would, he basically went through three – full classes of just outstanding players at least and just kept putting guys in the NBA went to two final fours I believe and was just you know bringing in elite talent to to Ohio State so I I feel like I just listed a bunch of the things that you were going to say and took the words out of your mouth but go ahead and and make the case for for Mata at three yeah I think with with Mata at three you know to your point it happened so fast you know Ohio State was coming off of sanctions, and he comes in. I want to say they win the Big Ten in year two, I want to say, under him. And the Big Ten tournament for a while was the Ohio State Invitational. Like, it seemed like they would win it every year. And in addition to winning four conference tournament titles, he won five Big Ten titles, which only trails Izzo on this list. Um he won coach of the year three times. You know, we talked about the elite talent that he had with, with Greg Oden and those guys getting to a championship game. He gets to another final four with Sullinger. Um, you know, I think to your point, like he kind of gets forgotten about because it ended abruptly. And, you know, kind of after D'Angelo Russell, they, you know, the last couple of years, he didn't make the tournament and then just kind of went away. So if he does, if he has a better end to the Ohio State career, he's probably number two on my list ahead of Bo. But because of how things ended, and, uh, I think Ryan Bo Ryan's success kind of kept him above Mata because he did it for longer. All right, so we have the same guys in the top four. Our just our two and four were switched. Um, yep. So like I said, Bo was number four. Uh, you know, I feel a little bad about it, but not too bad. You know, they. If, you won, if, you, if they could have hung on, also if they could have hung on against Duke, that one kills me, and I'm not even a Wisconsin fan. Same. Like when you get that close with that generational team, it's tough. But nevertheless, uh, like you said, the top four finishes is is a great metric I think to use, and doing that every year, insane. Uh, especially you know you and I know well, I know how hard it can be. I, as I'm talking to a Michigan State fan here, how hard it can be to uh, you know watch your team outside of that top four for many years. Um, but I'm curious who you have at top at uh, number five because. I had to go with for this one, and I think it's kind of a no-brainer unless I'm just completely forgetting somebody, but I had to go with another current coach uh, and Matt Painter, who is on a similar track to a lot of these coaches. He might not have the Final Four or the the deep runs in March to match some of these guys, but I think if he stays there, which I have no reason to believe he won't, um, I think he'll get there eventually. Yeah, I had Painter at five as well. Um, I think the only thing that hurt him uh, was the lack of Final Fours. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, three Big Ten titles, you know, four-time Big Ten coach of the year. Have they won the Big Ten tournament? I don't think they have. Just once. Once? Yeah, just once. What year was that? Uh, 2009 with Hummel. That's right. 
Right, um, right. Oh, yeah, because they beat Illinois that year. Or no, that would have been 08, I'm thinking. I think they beat Ohio State in the final. Yeah, yeah. Um, Baby boilers. It's, it was one of those things where, like, you know, if Robbie doesn't get hurt in 2010, maybe he gets that Final Four. Um, obviously, they're a Diakite shot away from getting to the Final Four. No way That's the other one that, that kills me. It's, it's Wisconsin 2015 and Purdue uh, 2019 that just hurt me as a Big Ten fan, and I'm not even super attached, you know, at a – at a grassroots level to those teams. Yeah, same. Um, especially the Purdue one, because you know, they hadn't been in the Final Four in, you know, nearly 40 years. Now it's over 40 years. And the way Carson was playing, I wanted to see more of that. I at least wanted one more game of that. And, you know, the way that the bracket opened up, like, oh, they would have gotten Auburn and you know, in the Final Four, like they might have actually been able to win the whole thing. Um, but you know, despite that, you know, Painter's done a really good job of being able to adapt to his uh, talent. And so, you know, whether it's going with bigs with, you know, Biggie Swan again or Isaac Haas and kind of playing through them, or it's, oh, we've got guard centric guys like, you know, Carson and Klein, and we're just going to bomb away from three. But he does a very good job of using his coaching uh, based around his talent. It's not just jamming a square pig in a round hole. Uh, he does a really good job of adapting to his personnel. All right, unless I'm forgetting someone, on my list, there's quite a precipitous drop-off as far as, like, sustained Big Ten success, partly because some guys are new, partly because some guys didn't stick around. Um, who is your number six? Because mine, I have a feeling ours are going to veer off in different directions here, but but we'll see. Who's your number six? I actually went with Bruce. Um, as you said, I thought, you know, one was a no-brainer. Two through four were pretty inter interchangeable, but those seemed like the the right spots for those guys. You know, Painter was clearly higher than anybody else, but not quite at the two to four level. And six through ten is like, I mean, you can probably put a bunch of different coaches in here. Uh, for me, it was Bruce. Um, you know, obviously we talk about the 05, you know, team and, you know, they get all the way to the title game. Uh, but he also won another Big Ten title. He went to six NCAA tournaments, got to a couple of Sweet 16s. Uh, so, you know, I think he still, even though it didn't end well, I think what he did early was enough to get him as high as he is on this list. Uh, there aren't a lot of guys who have won multiple Big Ten titles to begin with. And then when you add a Final Four to that, it seemed to kind of put him in the sixth spot for me. So I had Bill Self, and this is where our, our – I think um, perspectives kind of shaped this list, especially when it comes to two different Illinois coaches in similar eras. And, you know, I think if you were just comparing the resumes of coaches since 95, you have Bruce in the exact right spot. Um, I'm going to put Bill Self there because he is the guy who took it from a Bruce Weber type level, which I think is what Lon Kruger had it at, and elevated it to national, you know, elite contender status bringing in the you know your d brown darren williams luther head type players nba caliber talent um in, in darren williams case lottery pick talent and and making illinois you know for a little bit there on on the level of for you know six years or so i know he was only there four or five years but making that program a michigan state type program um so he was my six and and i just think with weber you know even though he definitely has some of the accolades and some of the uh, numbers to measure up. He just objectively left the program worse than he found it, which is hard to do when you're taking over from someone like Bill Self. But uh, that's why I had, had Bill Self at six. So um, I don't I don't know if you had Self in any of yours, but uh, just just to get that caliber of a coach in the Big Ten, uh, now a guy who has a lifetime contract at Kansas is is significant in my eyes. No, I actually had him uh, seven. So okay. we're not too far off there. Um, I think he would have been much higher if he decided to stay in Illinois. Um, you know, to your point, you know, three seasons, uh, I think it was there three years, got two Big Ten titles, made the tournament every year, two Sweet Sixteens, uh, got to Elite Eight as a one seed in, in 2001. So he definitely made his mark in a short period of time. Um, and again, there just aren't a lot of guys who won multiple Big Ten titles. And so uh, when you add all of the stuff that you uh, mentioned as well, you know, it seems pretty, pretty easy to put him in the top 10 for sure. All right. So I didn't have Bruce in my top 10 at all, which just shows, you know, how, how Illinois Maybe. people close to it. Yeah. <laughs> the situation kind of can be colored by um, what happened, but I do have uh, 
a another short tenure coach, even though you know could could it's open to uh, to extension here because he could uh, be there for a very long time. It's Jawan Howard, and a lot of it goes into I think you know not necessarily because of the success that he's had, even though he has done very well in the two seasons that he's been in, uh, at Michigan, but goes to the conversation we had last week about him just kind of changing the narrative of former players being able to jump right back into college basketball and have success at a high level. Um, and again, like we talked about, like the burden shouldn't be on him, especially as a, a black guy to, to pave the way for other people to have the same opportunity, but that's kind of the, uh, unfair burden that's been put on his shoulders. He's he's now the example, right, for every former player that comes back to coach. And now it's the, the refrain on the sports talk radio or the message boards or whatever. Um, wherever you look, it's, well, Jawan Howard had success, so that justifies this hire. So I think that's a big deal. And, um, you know, he's done a great job coaching as well. And he, he could rock it up the list as well if, if he sticks around five, ten more years. Yeah, I, I I thought about Juwan. I didn't have him on my top ten only because it's been two years. Um, and the first year, you know, they were ninth in the Big Ten. Um, but obviously, he did an amazing job this year. You know, getting them to be a one C for the first time in nearly thirty years. And you know, they're a bad shooting day away from being in the Final Four. Um, you know, I think he he definitely did a great job. And to your point, like he looks like he is now a Trailblazer coach, where it's like. Oh, everybody's doing a Jawan Howard thing where they're hiring an, an alum to come back to coach. And you didn't see that nearly as much, um, you know, before he started to succeed. And so I think if we do this list again, you know, April 2022 and Michigan has another great year uh, like they did this past season, like I can easily see him being on my top 10. The only reason why he wasn't is was because he's only been there two years. All right. Who did you have at eight? So eight, I actually went Tom Crean. Um, people don't realize how bad Indiana was when he first got that job. Um, and the fact that he was able to, you know, take it from, you know, I mean, bottom of the Big Ten type level to, you know, being overall uh, number one team in the country for a while, getting a one seed. Um, he won two Big Ten titles outright, which is really hard to do. I uh, got the three Sweet Sixteens. Uh, he got a coach of the year. He made four NCAA tournaments, but I think he was kind of a, a victim of the expectations of the school. And so, because Indiana, um, not everybody could be Bob Knight, obviously, but people, it seems like every time they hire a guy, they want him to be Bob Knight. Um, his accomplishments kind of get lost compared to if it was at some other school. I think a couple of Big Ten titles and three Sweet Sixteens in that short period of time, especially considering where they started, I uh, would be celebrated a lot more. Yeah, agreed. I uh, I also had had Crean at eight. And just because how it ended, like, I think it kind of um, distorts the, like you said, the reality of, of, of how big that lift was and how big that turnaround was. Um, and yeah, I guess I could, I could move him up potentially above Howard, uh, you know, there's a case to be made there, but yeah, I think he definitely deserves a spot. I, I went back and forth on, you know, how to fit some of these other programs in like Indiana, I feel like has to have a spot they, they've been, they went to a national title game in this time period. Um, but like, they're in kind of a weird tweener spot. Like you said, they're, they're still not satisfied with, with where they are as a program. They've made a few coaching changes, but they're still extremely relevant in college basketball. So it, it'd feel weird not to have an Indiana coach somewhere in the top 10. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, and again, the fact that, you know, a guy who can win two Big Ten titles and make three Sweet Sixteens not even be on the list is to goes to show that, like, you know, the fact that Indiana has to kind of figure out what they want to be. And may, I don't know if expectations need to be, you know, changed or uh, tweaked, per se, but you're running off guys who win Big Ten titles. And it's really, really hard to win in the Big Ten, especially now when there's so many good coaches. Um, this isn't, you know, the 80s anymore, whereas, you know, you and – well, I guess the early 80s because the late 80s were good. But, you know, whereas just two or three programs now, you know, when you, you add a Maryland on top of it, like there's just a lot, a lot harder to win the league. 
All right. So who did you have at nine? Nine was tricky for me uh, because a lot of his accomplishments uh, were taken away by the NCAA. Um, but I'm a believer in I saw it, so it counts for me. And that would be Jim O'Brien at Ohio State. Um, you know, he another guy who won multiple Big Ten titles. Uh, he got to a Final Four with Michael Red and Scooney Penn, uh, four NCAA uh, tournament appearances, two-time Big Ten Coach of the Year, uh, won a conference tournament title. Um, this is a guy who, I mean, he won. Like, he won a lot of games. And unfortunately, this time, uh, you know, kind of gets erased because of sanctions and this and that. And so I would have had him higher if not for the sanctions. Uh, but it did play a little bit uh into my decision but again i saw michael red play i saw them beat maryland and st john's i saw scooney penn play and they were awesome but and i also had ken johnson like i remember those teams you know they would fight that michigan state title team you know and they would go at it and so i remember how good those teams were and he was a big reason why see this is where definitely our you know our ages and our perspectives come into play because like I have no memory of, of Jim O'Brien's teams did have Scooney Penn on the podcast. He was cool. Nice. Um, but, but yeah, you know, and, and maybe it's because the history has been erased to some degree. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't even have Jim O'Brien on my list because I just kind of out of my, um, you know, out of my frame of reference, which really isn't an excuse, but it's just, <laughs> just a fact. Yeah. Um, I had, uh, I had Underwood at, at nine and I know, that could be a very um, homer pick, but the trajectory I think he's put Illinois on is could be similar to um, some of the coaches we listed, you know, higher in the top ten. Uh, and I think his his accomplishments warrant a a spot when you look at some of the other options that were kind of knocking on the door at the at the bottom of the top ten here. Um, you know, they have the Big Ten tournament title, they have the one seed. They have a lot of work to do. You know, he could slide down this list if if uh, if they can't kind of reload here with some of the some of the departures that they might and and are enduring. But um, yeah, I, I I snuck him in just because it was another project, another lift of a a program that was down for a long time and really had all the tools uh, from a resource resource perspective to be much better, similar to. In Indiana before Crean got there, similar to some of the football uh, examples that we listed, similar to the beeline before he got there in Michigan. So um, he snuck into the list. Again, it could be a, a, a bias of mine, but I struggled to come up with other options um, at, you know, at the bottom of this list, especially. Yeah, it definitely got much harder uh, the closer you got uh, the 10. Um... I thought about Underwood, but I think it's another one of those things where I need to see another year or two of it uh, before yeah. I put them on the list. Uh, maybe if they would have gotten to a Final Four, I might have done it. Uh, for me, and we're going back to a school where the expectations have been out of whack, uh, but for me, it would be Mike Davis. I have Mike Davis at 10. Um, a lot of people don't remember he won a Big Ten title. You know, to step into the shoes uh, you know, replacing a legend like Bob Knight and they get to a national title game, you know, they lose to, you know, our now Big Ten brethren in Maryland. Uh, but it's, to get there like they did as a five seed, um, you know, to knock off that Duke team in the Sweet 16. But in addition to that, like four NCAA tournament appearances, and again, it's really, really hard to win in the Big Ten. It's really hard to win a Big Ten title. And he was able to do that. And the fact that we're running off coaches that won Big Ten titles, like it just kind of goes to show where the the uh, the expectations are at that school. But I believe he was the only guy on my list that did not have multiple Big Ten titles. And I think that kind of goes to show how hard it got once you got the nine or ten. I feel like it was a lot of interchangeable guys you could put there but i ultimately settled on mike davis yeah and you know maybe i would have turgeon over my guy at number 10 uh, if he was hired during the big 10 or if he was hired when the big 10 entered um the league but he was there before i'm sorry when maryland entered the big 10 is the, the correct way to phrase that uh but i had and you know this is 
not the, the strongest pick when it comes to overall resume, but just the accomplishment and the nature of, of um, the platform that this coach elevated this program to. Uh, I had Chris Collins at 10, um, just because of his achievement of getting Northwestern to the NCAA tournament. Uh, I think they hoped that it would have been a Pat Fitzgerald type of steady upward trajectory there. Um, clearly, Collins' last few teams have dropped off a little bit. Um, but, you know, that was such a big deal at the time, and it remains a big deal to this day. Uh, it remains to be seen if he can get back to that level. But it was kind of, you know, one of those last, you know, insurmountable summits that, that existed in sports. And even though it was a lower bar than, like, a championship, just making the NCAA tournament, it still is a big deal. And and that program also has benefited from from his stability and you know his predecessor did not have not done a, a terrible job he had some foundation there but um he he was able to build them to a level that was exciting nationally for a little while and also um you know got them the, the facilities they need to compete there as well yeah i mean there, there's no question collins getting into the tournament is, is one of the probably five biggest big 10 stories of the last decade um you know we made a show out of it you know <laughs> the fact that he yeah. was going to do that um, and not just do that, but like they won a game, they pushed Gonzaga, you know, a Gonzaga team that I believe made it to the national championship they're, game. They're runner up. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I was a team, I was a really, really good team. And, you know, the fact that he was able to get guys to, to buy in defensively, you know, they were kind of coming from a, a Princeton style where it was more of a try to beat you with execution as opposed to beat you with toughness. Like you wouldn't expect a Northwestern, uh, basketball team or football team really to just beat you by manning up and just being better and you know for that that short period like Collins was able to do that um, hasn't had the success recently like you said um, which is why he wasn't on my list but you know we can't lose sight of the fact that that's one of the biggest accomplishments the league has seen you know based on the fact that they've never been and they were the only power five school that hasn't gone and so the fact that they were able to get that monkey off their back um, and, and the way that they did it was really impressive. All right, real quick, H, any honorable mentions before we wrap up for uh, for basketball? Uh, Jawan and Underwood were were two of mine for sure. Um, I think it was just a longevity thing for me for uh, Jawan. Um, if he has another year like this, I think he easily gets on the top 10. Uh, Underwood, I just have to see you know him do this again. Uh, he's been at Illinois longer than Juwan's been at Michigan, but um, this is kind of the first real like championship level team he had. Like the last year's team was good, you know, they're a top four team in the Big Ten, but not quite at the level of this year. So, but he's got them now at a level of they should consistently be in the top twenty-five, and they're getting guys who can go pro, and you know, it's kind of looking like some of the early Bill Self teams, and we'll see if he can keep that going. Could have big two Big Ten titles. Um, was one game out or less from having two. Uh, sure. It's interesting to, to think about it that way, but I'm sure that, that can be said of, of plenty of these guys as well. There could be a few more trophies on the cases. You can always, you know, you can always get greedy, but um, yeah, we'll have to see. And, and appreciate you, you coming up with this concept. I'm sure we'll have to brainstorm more as we continue to, to fill time here in the spring and summer. Um, but it was a lot of fun. I, I it's, a, it's a blast, you know, chatting about this stuff and hopefully we can do more of it here in the, the short term for sure. Yeah, yeah, I had a lot of fun doing this. I'm always, always like going down rabbit holes, thinking of, uh, you know, lists. Uh, little lists are kind of my thing, and we did that a ton at ESPN. So uh, that part's always fun. But you know, for anybody listening out there, if you got any ideas for us, if you want to, uh, you know, hit Alex or, or myself up about, hey, we want to hear you guys talk about this, please feel free. Um, you know, we're open, but we pretty much talk about anything. So uh, looking forward to whatever the next thing is. Yep. Even if they want to argue, we'll take it. <laughs> exactly. All right, H. Appreciate it. And we will talk soon. All right. Sounds good, man. All right. Thanks once again to Harold and Jenny for joining me. Really appreciate it. You'll not find two better people in the sports industry than those two. So appreciate them giving me a, a bunch of time for a really um, packed episode this week. It was a lot of fun. And I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed recording it. So appreciate that quick reminder that you can always find the take 10 podcast where podcasts are found uh, traditionally like your google podcast your apple podcast your spotify 
Podbean, places like that. And uh, the added element kind of touched on it in the interview with Jenny. In the COVID era is these interviews are on Zoom. They will continue to be. So we post them to YouTube on the Big Ten Network YouTube channel. There is a playlist specifically dedicated to the Take Ten podcast. So make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and you will not miss a uh, on-camera interview between me and our guests. So go ahead and do that. Leave comments, positive ratings, reviews. I mean, if you have to leave a negative rating, I guess, go ahead. You know, it still is an engagement, but we love the uh, positive feedback. We love any feedback. And we appreciate everyone for tuning in as always. All right, one last thank you is gonna go out to Julie Bronder, our producer, editor, she stitches the show together and gets it ready for the masses. So thanks to Julie. And um, thank you, as always, to everyone as we enter more of a quiet period in college athletics in, um, at Big Ten Network as well. Even though we do have some spring sports wrapping up here at Big Ten Network, I know we got uh, NCAA volleyball championships with the Big Ten well represented, as always. So go Big Ten in the... Uh, the volleyball finals in Omaha. All right. That is all I got for today. We'll talk very soon. So keep it locked on the Take 10 podcast platforms. And we will talk to everyone very soon.